And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bench with Bubba, episode 149. We're going to talk some fantasy baseball starting pitchers, and nobody better to do so than the one and only. You find him on Twitter at PitcherList, Nick Pollock. How we doing, man? What is happening? Thank you so much for having me. That is uh, really kind uh, that, that you to suggest that I'm the one and only and the oh, guy for this. You are definitely one of the top ones up on there. I started uh, following you last season, and I started with your uh, your morning show, is what I'll call it. So <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you're like your you know 10 to 15, 20 minutes just roundup of the night before, and it kind of really clears the head. And then I started getting everything else. I'm still trying to learn the dictionary because it makes me laugh. Half the, stuff <laughs> you guys, half the phrases you put out there, I just can't stop laughing. Oh, man. Like, pause podcast, but the, the glossary, the glossaries are a ridiculous thing. I I forget some of them. Like there was double bubble. Which is a guy that you pick up, you're so excited about for the first like week, and then you realize why am I still chewing on this, and you get rid of it. That's outstanding. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the Dona, fun time. The Dutch yeah. invasion. Like, there's so many just great ones. Like, I have it up here just in case you start going on something. <laughs> that's but, funny. Uh, it, was, it it makes me laugh. Uh, before we get going on some recent news and everything, why don't you let everybody know what you have going on because they most likely do. But you dropped the big announcement like a week or so ago. Uh, yeah. So uh, so we have Pitchless 4.0 now, which is really exciting. Um, with us at, uh, at pitcher list, we have the biggest gift database on the internet. You can look up any pitcher, see what they throw and also blurb about that. That's 2,800 plus gifts made for every pitcher in the majors. Really excited about it. And we have this massive staff where we're going to be having 10 to 15 pieces of content every day from your daily roundup that I do of every pitcher from the night before all 30 starters. I write about them for fancy implications to your rankings, to your going deep pieces, your anti list. We have a lot of stuff. So hopefully uh, there's a place for everybody at, at Pitcher List. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And one thing that you added this past year I really enjoy is your, like, not baseball drafts. Yeah. Or, or, like, there's so much fun because deep down inside, we all love fantasy baseball, but we're all baseball fans. So we yeah. all can relate to these drafts going on. And it makes me laugh because, like, where it's happening. I get almost more anything <laughs> by that than other things sometimes. Yeah, we had the fictional players draft. We had the PVAL draft, which is us drafting for pitch info PVALs. Uh, just on pitches alone. So like Verlander's four seamer and then the total of P Val equates your, uh, who, you know, whoever has the highest amount wins that year. It's stuff like that. We just, you know, it's just a massive fancy baseball community. And we just do whatever we want. Cause it's fun. No, that's awesome. And I heard you got a little app possibly coming out soon. That's too, right. So yeah. We're so stoked about that. We can't wait. Yep, going to be awesome. So, yeah, go check that out. For Obviously, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm pretty sure you know who Nick and Pitcher's List is. But, you know, go check out all their great stuff there. Go listen to the Fireside Chat, all the fun stuff they have. I'm going to get a little dose of it today, though. So let's get into it. Recent kind of news going on. There's really no signings since I last recorded. Mm -hmm. But we do have some interesting news. And I think you're the guy, that, one of the guys to talk to here, Clayton Kershaw. I've been anti-Kershaw all season. I've been saying that left and right. The back scares me. But now it's now it's even his arm now. Like it was it was dead arm one day, and now it's like he can't even play catch. Are we overanalyzing this, or is this like a real concern you're having on Kershaw? This is interesting because I see a lot of people say, "Oh no, it's nothing." Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of value to get now. I am staying far away. I mean, I, I already had him at 12 in the preseason ranking, and that and the one that came out in February, where we didn't really know anything. We just assumed there might be something because of his back and all. But now I'm it's a risk you don't have to take. I think I, uh, I mean, obviously if he's going outside the first 10 rounds or if it's closer to 15, when you already have all these warts anyway, with pitchers fine, True. but I just see this as uh, okay, go get raw stripling. Now yep. uh, that's what actually I did this morning in the, uh, the great fantasy baseball invitational uh, is I see risk raw stripling as a top 35 starter now. And with Kershaw, if, it's just so much, of a headache that you can just not do it and everything is fine. You don't have to do anything. Just ignore it and you'll be fine. Yep, like you said, it's a headache not worth having. It's it's one right. of those. It's almost if you got a hundred. Okay, let's put it this way: Do we almost feel like he's going to be the <laughs> the new Rich Hill on the Dodgers? Even though, oh no, no don't, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> Where it's like, okay, give me that five minutes and be happy and walk away. Oh man, yeah, the, Rich Hill for me, I put him at I think sixty. Because I just don't want it. I just I know it's going to be at the end of the day productive. And for the great fantasy baseball invitational, I understand because it's roto, so you can just sit him there and then everything is fine, I guess. But uh, it's just something you just I don't want to deal with. Yeah, I've, I've been tweeting out throughout the fantasy invitational when certain guys in my draft take certain players. I'm like, thank God, now I don't have to worry about that player. I don't have to worry about that. Right, exactly, yeah. taking it off the table for it makes it so much easier. 
Um, just for fun, real quick, we'll move off of Curry shot here. Mm-hmm. Like another big lefty in the NOS that's kind of questionable right now, Madison Bumgarner, who we have on the outline later. W- which one of those two would you rather have if you had to have one? If I had to have one, honestly, I think at this point, this is crazy. I think it's going to be Bumgarner. Really uh, only because I I trust that he's going to have more innings. I don't like Bumgarner at all. I, I even had him, I think I'm at 31. Uh, I don't expect to have Bumgarner in any league either. And just because I necessarily like Bumgarner more yeah. doesn't mean I'm going to draft him either. So, yeah, I guess if I had to, I, I'm probably going to have Bumgarner at higher in my rankings when the, the season starts. Okay, that's what I kind of figured. That's why I wanted to bring it, kind of bring it to the forefront for everybody. That's how you can really analyze this Kershaw deal because I think it's terrifying. Like people that want to draft Kershaw right now, you really better have a backup plan. And Ross Stripling is a great one to have, as you said. Um, let's talk about the Seattle Mariners' new toy. I know you went gift happy the other day, if rightfully so. Uh, UC Kikuchi really uh, even impressed Joey Votto. Let's just put it that yeah. way. <laughs> so, um, what's your thoughts? I know you know spring training. We t- should take your grains of salt, but so far, so good. Right. Uh, so the thing about Kikuchi that surprised me a bit was how much he was using his curveball. Uh, we kind of had this understanding of fastball slider combination. And we actually didn't even see anything of a changeup. I don't know if we were expecting one, but I didn't. I don't think I saw a single one the entire time. Uh, but he actually used his curveball a good amount more than that slider. We did get a taste of what he can do with up and in fastball and then a slider to uh, Yasiel Puig that started in the same place and fell to his ankles. I got a check swing strike. It was great, and I expect to see a lot of that closer to the season. I think this was Kikuchi trying to figure out that curveball a bit, and it looked good. Uh, he struck out Vado on one that was a complete miss on his account, but it just happened to fall in the right place and get a weird swing for Vado because it surprised all of us as well. I uh, I think he is going to be a number four, number five. Uh, good fastball command. He was going actually up to 95 last uh, on, I guess this was Monday. Maybe it was Tuesday. I forget what day it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I was, I was impressed. Um, it was kind of what I thought we would get. And it's nice to see that fastball polish now. Uh, so yeah, I, I have him around 42 or so at the moment. I think that's where he should be going for the most part in drafts. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because right now, just in the month of February, uh, he's going around pick eight, 185 in NFPCs. Mm-hmm. He's going as high as 148. So I, I see that helium continue to climb here. A guy going right in front of them. Would you rather have a Kikuchi or like a Dallas Keiko? We don't even know where he's playing yet. Oh, not even close. Uh, Kikuchi, 100%. I okay. uh, I am so far out on, on Keuchel. Uh, 374 ERA last year was was the floor. I'm putting in quotes, even though I think he just get a lot worse. He dropped eight points in O swing on both his slider and his uh, on sliders chase rate and swing strike rate, and that's a major red flag. The problem with Keuchel is that he's lost a bit. Uh, he even got so lost that his former blueprint of going at the bottom of the zone with everything. Uh, he couldn't do that anymore. He actually had tried to go up in the zone. Eno wrote a great article at The Athletic talking about it, and that's not Keuchel. <laughs> and he mm. had a couple games of success there, and then it stopped working because that shouldn't work. And he tried to go back to the bottom of the zone, and it's still not really there for him. So with that slider not getting the swings that it used to, the sinker doesn't get the same swings that it used to, and everything falls apart. Uh, so I could see this as a 4-plus E right year. I see him as what I call a Toby which is um, someone you have on your team, but you that gets the work done, but you don't like him, like Toby from The Office. Yeah, all and... Office fans should respect the heck out of that, <laughs> that one. That, that, the first time I heard that Toby, I'm like, oh, that's just perfect. It's absolutely perfect. He's there to so, do the work, but you don't want him at all. <laughs> right, you just look at him and go, ah, oh, but then you go to the waiver wire and you think, no, all right, I guess I have to hold on to this guy. <laughs> it's it's so frustrating. True. And I don't. I have a philosophy, I don't draft Toby's. I feel you can find Tobies on the waiver wire through the year if you need them, but I don't draft them. So I'm not touching Keiko, but Kikuchi, I think, could be better than that. Uh, I think he has a little bit more strikeout upside, a little more dependability with those ratios. So I, I vastly prefer Kikuchi than Keiko. I like it. Let's talk about a couple of St. Louis Cardinals here just because they kind of go yin and yang together. Miles uh, Michaelis just got an extension. Good for him. He's going on pick 92. He's likely to be the ace now because Carlos Martinez mm-hmm. – is now in a sling. It wasn't just you know a shoulder problem because of workouts. He's in a legit sling, right. which is oh, not man. good. Um, he's gone as low as two sixty three now in the month of February. And I, I don't like like Kershaw. I want nothing to do with him. But how do you look at these two St. Louis pitchers? So this is really funny. I uh, and we'll talk about Josh James in a moment too. But essentially with Carmore and Josh James, I was I was pumping a lot of the helium into the, their balloons. 
And then to see so early, it's not even March yet, that I'm saying, just never mind. I never said any of that. <laughs> Ignore it all. Uh, yeah, with, with Karmar, as you said, avoiding it uh, completely. I'm just not going to draft. I mean, if you get him for a dollar in an auction, sure, that's great. I expect someone will take you know $5 or, or more on Martinez. He could be closing at the end of the year if you need some. Uh, if you need some investment there in saves. But with Michaelis, I actually think he's undervalued a bit. Uh, I've seen him... Actually, I almost took him in my league, uh, my great fantasy baseball invitational league. He went past pick 100. He was even close to 120. Wow. That's fantastic value. I have him around pick uh, the, the 25th starting pitcher. I think the worries that we have of his ratio regression, which should be expected. His sub-3 ERA probably won't be repeated. Uh, his sparkling whip should go up a bit, even though there's a really low walk rate that makes it easier for him to have a better whip. Uh, I think that should be mitigated a bit by an increased strikeout rate. He has a very good slider. I think we'll start seeing him using it more as a weapon this year. And his fastball, he's not a soft tosser that we normally see from these ratio pitchers. He can go 95. That's actually a thing he does a lot. So with a big curveball, he gets for strikes. It's all there. Changeup isn't actually that bad, too. It's a split change that can miss bats as well. I think we have the tools of a 23% plus strikeout rate arm. And that really speaks to top 25 pitcher, especially with hinting at 200 innings like he can this year. So I think Michaelis is actually a bit of a steal at that price. If I knew that he were going at 120, I would be waiting a lot more and aim for him at the very least as my SB3, if not SB2. Yeah, that'd be nice because right now on the NFBC, right before him, you have Zach Wheeler, Mike fulton right behind him, David Price. It's kind of an interesting smorgasbord of almost uh, a lot of flashy names and uh, which one are you going to go with? And Mikulis kind of seems like he just gets kind of lost in the mix there. So it's very, very right. interesting. And uh, the strikeout upside could be huge because most people, you know, they think about him last year. Low whip, he's not walking guys, but he wasn't striking out a ton. At least that's what it seemed like to people. And then you, you're breaking down his arsenal and that, that could be really intriguing. Yeah, I think there's just a lot more there than people realize. No doubt about it. Let's talk about that, uh, Josh James. We talked about it before the podcast started. I, I wanted to cry earlier this morning. But, <laughs> um, yeah, um, the hype train was real. It was it was oh, what man, it was, so and it just got derailed so fast, so, so <laughs> fast. And I, I was telling Nick before the show, I drafted him last night in TGFBI, and I woke up to the news. So that was exciting. I'm um, so sorry. No, it's not your fault at all. I'm a grown-ass man, and I made that pick. But um, <laughs> when you're uh, looking at Josh James, because it's a calf injury, and it depends on where you read. You know, right now, it's all, re all red alert stuff. But he's going to come back and pitch eventually this year. If, say, you can get 130 innings or so, or Josh James, are you still in on him, or are you just really concerned now? I'm really concerned because the Astros have two options to fill that spot. So you have Verlander and Cole, obviously. You have Wade Miley, they signed. He's starting. Colin McHugh definitely should have that fourth spot. I would be drafting him in that way uh, uh, in this preseason. So that fifth spot, we pretty much assumed Josh James had it. It wouldn't be Framber Valdez. Uh, Forrest Whitley is going to take some time. They're going to be, you know, they're going to start his clock later on. Uh, and then uh, you also have Brad Peacock, who just seemed more out than uh, Josh James. Josh James just seems so prepared to be in the rotation. But if he's out now, then I would imagine Peacock gets that fifth spot. I'm definitely looking at him now in drafts because of that. Uh, I would also think that Peacock would have a bit of volatility and Forrest Whitley would be the next in line, maybe even Framber Valdez as they work Josh James as a as a reliever for now. I don't think a 130 innings are likely for, for James, James, unfortunately, as much as I love his stuff. Um, obviously, this is all based on one tweet from AJ Hinch this morning, <laughs> um, saying he has this strained quad and that he's not in the mix now for the rotation. Maybe they decide, you know what, we don't want you to in that relief uh, role. We want you actually to go back and be a starter. And then maybe that does happen. Considering how many options the Astros have, I do think that they'll go from Peacock to Whitley first instead of having James in there and then push off Whitley until uh, the end of the year. I don't really see that as much. So it, it's possible maybe someone else gets injured and then James gets those innings. But I wouldn't be shocked if it's 100 innings tops for James this year. Yeah, it's the embarrassment of riches that the Houston Astros have. And I'm glad you mentioned that Brad Peacock because everywhere I've looked today, it's, you know, Framber Valdez, everyone, everyone wants Forrest Whitley to take it. And I agree. Why are they going to start his clock when you don't need to? There's guys that can yeah, sit no there to take the role for a little bit. The Astros, they've worked the system so well to get to where they are. Why ruin it now? 
Um, but that Peacock move was very, very interesting because he has some filthy stuff when he's in there. So I think that's a, a sneaky, nice pick that you can basically get for free right now. Obviously, he'll be on the rise here with the, the James news, but still very, very cheap, at least for the time being, while he's getting to start. So not a bad call at all. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, by the way, I, I saw someone in my league as well auto pick Josh James. That's Alex Becky at Baseball HQ just 30 or an hour ago. So uh, it's being felt across across invitational. I think, I think when we get done recording, I'm going to go into Twitter and, and announce when the candlelight vigil will be held later today <laughs> for all of us that have, have taken that leap. But uh, oh, sadly, man. the sad news, as we all know, when you draft this early, it's fun. It's great. We love the draft. There's going to be a lot more of this. That takes place in the next yeah. few weeks. It's going to be, true. it's like a war of attrition just to get to the opening day pretty soon. So <laughs> let's uh, let's talk some starting pitchers. Uh, about a week or so ago, I had Matt Modica on talking top twenty-five NFPC in January. We're going to go mm-hmm. kind of outside the top twenty-five for February, and some of those names that were in the top twenty-five are not anymore. So it's kind of funny with some of these top names here. We'll kick it off, and I'm going to go over him again just because I, I love to get your opinion on him. But Herman Marquez. Uh, it's such a volatile question. You either love him, you hate him, the Coors effect, he can break Coors, whatever narrative you want to give. What's your thoughts on Herman Marquez this year coming to fantasy? Well, okay, a couple things. Uh, one is that it's, again, a headache. It's a question mark, an enigma that I don't like going for. I'm, I'm someone that avoids enigmas and confusions and hazy situations. Uh, I generally go for... Guys that have upside, but a clear path to that upside that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And with Marquez, there's just so many questions that, hey, this could be a top 15 starter. Uh, that is obvious, but it could also be an outside the top 40 guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that he only had seven core starts in that 17 start run is a little, okay, it's not like he just defeated cores That's a great uh, point. in that respect. Um, that does make me a little hesitant, and I can't, I can't run away from this. I've been saying this the entire offseason. There's so many similarities to John Gray and how we mm-hmm. are hyping Herman Marquez. And I remember last year, I, I, I stuck Gray in the 40s uh, because I didn't know what to do with him. And he became the pitcher that no one wanted to talk about because <laughs> we didn't know what to do. No one collectively knew what to do with John Gray. And I feel we're going to have to do the same song and dance this year for Herman and Marquez a bit. Now, I have John Gray and Herman Marquez 50 spots apart, 28 and 78. Mm-hmm. Um, because Gray, I just never feel like I can trust him. I can imagine myself trusting Herman if he goes through the first month and everything is just still cooking with that curveball and slider down, using breaking balls with two strikes more often than his fastball, etc. But I, I'm still very hesitant. I don't trust Marquez's fastball as an elite pitch. And that's a scary thing to me. Uh, in cores still so i'm out for the most part i saw him fall to the 11th round at times and like okay i will go for it there but otherwise i I, i'd be surprised if i have marquez in my drafts this year yeah that's the kind of thing i'm looking at if he falls to us everyone's got a value and that's just how it works um and that's where you have to kind of know where that line's at and then you can take your chance or whatever because if you're if you're debating between like herman marquez and like I'm not like Luke Weaver's even later, but you know what I mean. Situations right, like course, that. Yeah, so, okay, I'll take I'll take the stuff with Marquez, but it's going to be really interesting to see how it goes. Clay Link tweeted it out like a couple of weeks ago. I think the thing to do with Marquez is Clay Link tweeted out his opening schedule. It's like at San Francisco, at San Diego, I think at Miami. His home games are against bottom feeders. It's like first five or six starts are cush, like really really nice. I think if you could get like get a hot start from him and then flip him, obviously you can't. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. TGFBI, but you get him off to a hot start where people are like, "Oh, look at he is this good pitcher before he hits Murderer's Row." Because Coors Field doesn't play tough the first month of the season usually because it's still so cold, and so mm-hmm. looks can be deceiving. And I, I think that's an intriguing way to do it if you can like, get him at value, flip him for something else. But that, that's also a lot of work, and you have to hope it works out. But it's an interesting idea. I, I was brainstorming. Yeah, that is interesting. Before. I like that. Because you, you can maybe get a couple players out of it. Um, we can do this one real quick. You already kind of mentioned him. He's been dropping because I talked about him a couple weeks ago. But now he's down to the uh, 29th pitcher off the board, pick 78-ish, Madison Bumgarner. Um, velocity was up in his first spring start, but he also got shellacked in the second inning. Mm-hmm. So pick your poison there. What's your overall thoughts on Mad Bums? I know you said you're not in on him. He's kind of that questionable headache guy. But what what is it that really turns you off on him? 
Yeah, the the fact that I uh, okay, there, there are two things. One, his curveball hasn't been good for a while, uh, and it overperformed last year. It really shouldn't have done as well as it did, as far as balls in play. Um, I think that saved him and that masked his uh, his four forty two Sierra turned that into a three twenty six ERA. Um, it was under a twenty percent strikeout mark, which is really concerning for two straight years. His overall whiff rate dropped to nine point two percent. That's not good at all. And the fact that he throws uh, from the side a bit. Now, this is something I talk about a lot with weird arm angles. Often, those weird releases dictate worse overall command. It's just different timing. He's throwing so across his body that you really have to get a good feel for when you release it. It's so much easier going north to south and release. Look at Noah Syndergaard. Look at, I mean, if you watch Chris Paddock yesterday, you can see the mechanics of just going straight over the top of the ball. And it allows him to go in and out and up and down very easily. It's a much simpler adjustment uh, for a location. Going across your body like that, it can be a lot tougher to get the exact timing of when you release from your arm going east to west. Uh, so, or I guess in ba- Bumgarner's case, it's west to east. <laughs> but I, uh, but so that itself uh, makes me question if his fastball command can be good enough to set up that cutter properly. And the curveball feel isn't there right now. It all dictates a guy that is laboring a bit. It's not as easy to come as it used to be. And I'm not going to buy into that. I, I don't want to think that he's going to be able to perform what he used to do three years ago. I feel that his ability has degraded. And he's not this electric strikeout guy that he used to be. That will give you elite ratio, ratios over 200 plus innings. I don't see that from Bumgarner. So I'm out on Bumgarner. I don't think he's going to have this renaissance that we're all waiting for. Yeah, I'm not. Ex- I'm a Giants fan. I'm a diehard Giants fan. I'm not expecting him to be that guy anymore. I think I'm. I'm well past that um, obvious mark. But I'm just thinking. Okay, on a, he's going to eat innings, hopefully. Because I'm just wondering how he hasn't been healthy the last two years, and I, I know that that's not always the reason why there's a problem. And I agree with the arm angles always terrified me. Um, I, I just wonder. I don't expect the velocity to be great. I just know. When pitchers lose velocity, we watched it. We grew up with the the Braves in the the nineties mm-hmm. that none of them really threw hard. Smoltz kind of threw hard, but Glavin Maddox, there wasn't much. There, Steve Avery was a soft like it, they never threw hard, but they pitched. I think if a guy can figure out a pitch, Bumgarner is one of them. But the arm slide is a concern, and by no means all everything I just said there to try to be optimistic. I don't believe he is that guy that he was. I'm just thinking as he's falling in drafts now, similar to Marquez. I think there's going to be a value point where he becomes yes, of relevant. course, because like I took him in TGFBI towards the end of round nine, and I'm starting to get to that point where that was like pick one twenty something, one twenty five, one twenty six. I'm starting to think, okay, I can at least take the gamble there. I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances there, but yeah, he fell quite a while, and I, I get all why he's falling. I'm just wondering if I, I, Renaissance. I don't think is happening, but serviceable you know three or four on your fantasy team i can almost buy into it no i i i'd be remiss if i didn't bring in uh, alex think fast that's why i call that's why i say that my co-host on beyond the corner podcast the pitcher list uh where we talk about the mental game and uh, i i you mentioned that maybe Bumgarner can add a new pitch i does this no, it, wasn't wrong a new, here? it wasn't a, it wasn't a new pitch i'm just saying he could learn how to pitch like not just be oh, a thrower, okay. but be a pitcher and learn how to sure. use, you know, 89 like Maddox and those guys did compared to just trying to overpower guys I would, and, and do that way. I would make the case that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, as as far as different pitchers, you know, they, they come and go, Bumgarner is one that is more rigid in how he needs to tough True. it out. True. Does that make sense? I know this has he's a really weird like, argument. and uh, He's like a hard-nosed grinder that thinks he's got to be better, like stronger right. than you, tougher so than So I you. wouldn't think of him as like a True. tinkerer, someone True. that would be more receptive to that kind of thing. But that's just, I'm not going to draft based on that. It's just interesting. Yeah. No, I'm 100% with you. That's why I'm just curious to see how it pans out because he's such a hard ass, I guess, that I just don't see him wanting to go out there and get beat up time and time again. Yeah, so sure. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious to see how it works out. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about a guy that tilts me quite a bit because at first when they traded him from the Giants, I was like, okay, this really stinks. And then, you know, he was hurt for a while. I never wish anybody to get hurt. But I'm like, okay, we didn't lose this trade. Last year we officially lost the trade. No, it was um, five years. I know. But we had Carlos Beltran for three months. <laughs> it wasn't the same. But uh, now, Zach, that, Zach Wheeler. That was 2012, correct? Yeah. 
Didn't you Wait, win the World no, Series no, that no, year? No, no, it wasn't. The year they did it, Beltran did not win a World Series. Oh, no, 2011. It was 2011. Yeah. That's right. So I remember okay. when they did it, they were trying to go back to back. So I knew why they did it. I got, I understood that. <laughs> but it definitely did not work. And we gave I away mean, our number one pitching. It took, it, took, it took us seven years. That trade happened in 2011. <laughs> and for us to feel okay about, we, I mean, 2014 was a good season. But yes. 2018 was when we started to realize, oh, wait, this is exactly what we're waiting for. I'm a huge fan of Wheeler. Um, a lot of the pitchless staff is in the in the great fantasy baseball invitational. And it's funny how many of us have Wheeler. Uh, it's it's laughable. But I got him at 799, which I think actually was the latest anyone got him. I was very fortunate to get him. I uh, super happy as my SB2. I think the thing that a lot of people forget is that he goes deep into games. His last 17 starts last year recorded a 230 ERA. With an IPS as innings per start of six point seven, that's essentially six and two thirds. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, that that's what he does with this incredible elite four seam fastball. He keeps up in the zone a lot, and he pairs it up with a trio of secondary pitches. I would say that his slider is his primary secondary pitch, which is my favorite oxymoron. Uh, but then you have a splitter and a chi- and a curveball, and all three of those are above a ten percent whiff rate uh, or swing strike rate, I should say. So that's great. That's really cool that at any point he can go to any of these options. Uh, he has a lot of flexibility with it. Actually, at the drop of 4.0, that is uh, the relaunch of uh, Pitcher List this season, I did a gift breakdown about Zach Wheeler because I knew that this would be one of those picks that, oh, I need a. am uh, I'm looking at the Pitcher List, and I see Zach Wheeler at 18. I need to know more about this. Definitely read it. It's me tracking through one of his starts against Miami. And he just – you can see all of his pitches working, how his command is great and – how dominant he can be on the hill. So I'm a huge fan of Wheeler. There is obviously some injury risk. You wonder about the the toll of 180 plus innings last year and seeing if that will affect him for 2019. Honestly, I think that a lot of guys are going to have some question mark like that. And at 18, I really do feel that if he gets 180 plus innings again, this is definitively a top 15 starter. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. I'm a big fan of his. I take him over Herman Marquez and Bumgarner for sure. And those guys are going in front of him. Um, you mentioned the the six point seven, like six and two thirds innings pitched. You know, I'll bring up the the question because it's becoming more and more popular. That's a stat you could potentially look at for quality starts leagues, um, and that kind of stands out for a guy like Zach Wheeler. Where do you stand on quality starts versus wins? Oh, hundred percent quality starts, much better. Okay, much better. Okay. It's actually uh, the pitcher's to- ability as opposed to what team they're on. <laughs> exactly. I'm with you. I actually had someone tell me today when I, they said, I asked them, well, why don't you project saves? And they say, well, it's so dependent on so many situ- variables on the team. I said, well, then why do you project wins? And <laughs> they had no answer. So, uh, yeah. I mean, the only, the only answer for that is, oh, that's based on the innings. But yeah, that's still not even, yeah, it's yeah. weird. It's very Baseball's weird. Baseball's weird. All right. <laughs> it's fun. We're weird. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to skip Miles Mikolas because we already talked about him earlier. Sure. Uh, let's get to Luis Castillo, the guy everyone wanted on their team last year. Then he oh, has man. a really good second half to kind of get that interest coming up again. Where do we go with Castillo this year? We, uh, this is really funny. I remember Spore was texting me when he was doing um, well, one of these the mocks. Started. Yeah, right. No, well, that is true. Our first fireside chat was him on the in the car saying we need to talk about Luis Castillo. But I remember actually, I think it was back in October. Um, Spore was doing a mock with 15, uh, 15 team, essentially in FBC. And he was telling me that Luis Castillo was being drafted as a top 25 starter before pick 100. And it blew my mind because it's essentially the same price as it was last year. But we have more, we should have more concern now, right? Because we've seen how bad it can be. Yet we still assess in the same way. It's, it's wild to me. Um, so uh, hopefully that makes people understand why I was so high on him last year. Um, but, uh, here's the thing about Castillo is that he had this amazing second half and we had this second half in 2017 as well with that increased velocity up to 97. Um, I do wonder if he's a warm weather pitcher. Uh, if this is a case where it's always going to be a little bit tougher in March, April, May, for Castillo, and then once it starts getting consistently warm out uh, and hot, then he's going to really fall into everything else. I am, I'm a fan. I like to think that he's figuring things out more as he goes, and that changeup is so amazing, and really, it's an elite changeup. His slider is has improved over the course of last year. 
it's really just a question of is he going to get burned with that fastball or not. Uh, and I hope that he can take a step forward, at least in the command of it, because he is slinging it a lot as opposed to spotting it like uh, like other guys that we've seen. So I think that is the biggest area. And the reason I'm up on the velocity is because that can mask mistakes with the fastball. So you can get away with 97, 98 uh, in the middle as opposed to 94, 95 in the same spot. So hopefully yeah. we do see that velocity and uh, I, I'm in. I'm, I'm at 25. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd love to be back in on it. It's just really interesting to me with him. He's really, really good in one of the worst pitching ballparks in baseball and then he struggles on the road. I, I, but you mentioned the weather differences. I'm wondering if he's a young guy that likes the comfort of his own bed. Um, there's a lot of really interesting interesting things with Luis Castillo. Maybe with you know Sonny Gray and uh, Alex Wood, a couple of veterans coming over there, they can maybe kind of help a little bit. Yasiel Puig, you know, a little Latin influence. I don't know. Maybe there's some maturing that has to take place. It's really interesting because, like you said, the stuff is outstanding. It's just a matter of honing it all in. And I, I kind of a comp I want to put out here, and they're not drafted in the same area, but um, – going a while later but people have loved him he's another young arm that's very good at home not on the road what do you think about like jose barrios and how these two kind of relate to each other oh that's interesting i i prefer castillo because Bar barrios doesn't have a strong third option okay uh, luis castillo has has obviously the velocity has his unbelievable changeup and a very good slider that slider if you want to compare it to barrios's changeup is much better and more consistent. Uh, Barrios can go on these ridiculous stretches where his curveball just takes over. But if you look at the numbers of that curveball, I have his term a money pitch, which d details a, a pitch that has a 40% chase rate. So they're getting swings when it's thrown out of the plate or out of the zone. 40% uh, zone rate. That means he's comfortable throwing it inside the strike zone and at least a 15% swing strike rate. Barrios doesn't hit that. He doesn't even have 40% on either O swing or zone rate on his curveball. So that means he's not getting the amount of strikes that he needs consistently with that pitch. That is his best pitch. Uh, but actually, it's this fastball he had to rely on a lot more and it had success last year. But I don't, I can't really buy into Barrios if he doesn't have that changeup, sorry, that curveball that is elite because it's not acting like it right now. And without that changeup as a very strong third option, I have my questions if he can really elevate to that stud that we've seen at times last year. Yeah, that's what's really interesting because Barrios, top 25 pitcher, 72nd off the board, and Castillo, 107 off the board. And uh, I see similarities there, but I'm with you. I kind of feel, I don't think comfortable is the right word, but I feel like I'd much rather have Castillo on my squad and roll, roll the dice on that one than with Barrios. But it'll be interesting because the thing with Barrios that stood out when uh, Matt Modica mentioned it, I never realized it is how many innings he actually threw last year. He was a workhorse, even though he was having some rough outings. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to watching those two and see how they develop this year. Sure. Yeah. Um, another kind of interesting arm coming into last year that people were really high on. And then he had his issues and it's always been control with him. The strikeout stuff's been pretty darn good. Robbie Ray is going about pick 120 off the board. It's another guy that, you know, you wouldn't be shocked if he definitely out earns that price tag. At the same time, does he figure out the control? What's your thoughts on Robbie Ray? It's very weird. Um, <laughs> essentially, his final 13 starts, he finally found his curveball. Uh, he had this uh, little bit of a tumultuous start and then got went on to the DL. And we have a phrase of the DLH, which I need to change. It used to be DL hangover, which means, means that you don't start a guy on the first day back from the DL mm -hmm. stint. Now he's still ill or uh, injured list oh. layover. Um, that's what we're changing it to. Or just, essentially, he's ill. Uh, but uh, so Robbie Ray with that DLH, it took him some time to get his curveball back. And he got his curveball back uh, at July 25th. And the last 13 starts returned a 283 ERA with a 31.5% K rate. At the same time, he also had a 15% walk rate, 255 BABIP, 85% left on base rate, and a 407 Sierra in that time. So that's, like, that's kind of the story of Ray. Um, if he's cruising... Like, like I, I think that the best version of Ray is one that will always beat his peripherals, which sounds like a ridiculous sentence. I understand that. He's saying, oh, yeah, he's really good when he's out beating everything. Well, duh. But I actually think that what he brings to the table, the peripherals really talk about the three outcomes you can control, right? Walk rate, strikeouts, and home runs. Ray is someone that consistently is effectively wild. And there, I don't think there is a more uh, efficient or a better... Uh, the person to label in the league as effectively wild because I do believe that Ray is in situations where he says, okay, I'm either going to walk him or strike him out. 
-hmm. That's what's going to happen. And yes, you'll walk more guys than we want with that 15% walk rate. That probably will be like a nine or 10, probably 10, but he'll, he will come with a 31% walk rate. And I think that he'll actually not let those guys score. That's why we have the 85% left on base rate and 255 BABIP. Yes, it can be very volatile. I don't expect that 283 ERA that I quoted there, but I think a 320, 330 is actually kind of attainable uh, for Ray this year. The whip will probably be like 115, 120, and then you'll have an atrocious amount of strikeouts to come with it. I think I, I see a lot of comparisons with him and Chris Archer. Yep. And I don't, I, I think there's a sizable gap between the ratios you'll get from Ray and the ratios you'll get from Chris Archer, a very sizable one. So the fact that I have him like 25 to 30 spots in between. So I, I mean, I'm Ray. If he's falling past pick 100, one, around 130 or so, I, I think the comparisons with him and Archer are are not actually there. And I would definitely be targeting Ray if he falls that far. I can make him an SP3. He's falling quite a bit. That's why I was kind of wondering because the strikeout stuff, you don't find a lot of strikeout stuff like that outside of the elite arms. There's a few here and there. But um, like you said, if he is kind of literally just a 15 or 10 percent walk change and yes 10 percent still a lot that's still just so many opportunities for other positive regression signs that uh it's really interesting with robbie ray so i like i love his stuff you might need to go i'm not good with you know paint on microsoft paint and stuff but maybe go get the stella got her, her groove back cover and put ray got <laughs> his curve back and uh, have some fun with that but uh let's talk chris archer he's next on the list and i, I like chris archer i think he's got a great twitter presence he's fun I've seen way too much Chris Archer talk on Twitter for the last two and a half months about a pitcher that, <laughs> a pitcher that can be good, but I kind of have an idea of where you're going with this. What is it at pick 126 that people are seeing that you and I pretty much don't agree with? Well, okay. Um, the question, this is the question I ask. How does Chris Archer get better? Yeah, I don't see it either. Where where does he change what he's doing now to all of a sudden be a four ERA pitcher, which he hasn't done since in four years? Where does Chris, is it that changeup? Well, he went to the Pirates last year. He just had one game where he messed around with that changeup. Yep. That was it. It, it. This isn't. There's nothing here that speaks to Chris Archer being dominant again. The only thing I can imagine is him raising his velocity again, which I don't think he's going to with the, with the Pirates. Now, Alex Chamberlain had a really cool article on Rotographs talking about Archer bringing back his sinker. The Rays are very much anti sinker. And the Pirates are pro it, and it's possible that he introduces it again And because he had some success with it back in the day. It's an interesting suggestion, especially from Chamberlain, who is just like me, is very anti-sinker. I uh, I just I don't really think that's it. We're all just trying to figure it out, and I don't know why we're going to go after it. It's going to be detrimental to you. His ERA and whip is going to hurt. We can find strikeouts all, uh, elsewhere. We don't need to have this evil this toxicity <laughs> in our lineups. So I have my 56 and uh, I, I'm just not touching this whatsoever. Yeah. He's definitely one of those guys I talked to you about earlier that when someone else picks him, thank you. I don't have to yeah, worry about exactly, him. Right. You're good. Cause like right in front of them on ADP, you have Kyle Hendricks. Who, if you want to see a guy that uses the sinker and a change up, well, there you go. Um, and then right behind him, the next guy I want to mention who I see a lot of similarities when he's having his rough starts as Archer, but when he's dialed in, he's one of the better pitchers in baseball so I can see value here if you're willing to take the good and the bads, which we saw last year. Masahiro Tanaka is going to pick 136 off the board. Definitely risking us always pitching in that division, in that stadium, but we've seen him pitch really, really good at times. Do you have any you know, positive or negative? What's your thoughts on Tanaka? Yeah, the thing about Tanaka is uh, you see those the 474 ERA and the 375 uh, marks from the past two years, and people are just instantly staying away I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel that like he can be a 3-5 ERA pitcher. Agreed. And that's coming with a 14% swing strike rate. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That is such a stupid good swing strike rate for a pitcher. That's elite. That's, we're talking like yep. top 10 uh, in the majors of starters. And the fact that the 375 ERA last year came with a 113 whip. I don't think that should be ignored. Uh, yes, the ERA is not ideal, but that's a very productive whip. Uh, coming with a 25% K rate that should stick around again. Uh, it really does come down to the consistency of that split finger fastball. And people are saying, no, no, it's the, it's the four seamer that, or the four seamer or sink or whatever fastball mix he's using. Yes, that's always going to be bad though. And what makes it worse is when he doesn't have a splitter working on a given day to nullify it. 
Uh, when he ha he can honestly just go splitter slider all day uh, with an occasional curveball and sneaking in fastballs. And when he does that, that's when we see those amazing starts from Tanaka. It's just a question of okay, do I have my splitter today? Good. Then people should be off my fastball more than usual. Uh, I think he can be that 350 Sierra that we saw last year. I think there's room for improvement. I'm in on Tanaka. Yeah, I like him a lot. You know, you got to think about his his home run to five or his home run to five ball percentage is 21.2 and 17 and 17.7. Ridiculous. And 18. Yeah, that's insane. And he's been that way most of his career. Outside of eight, uh, 2016, 12 percent was his career low, and that's still not low. So right. it's just that's just what he does, and that's why when you talk about his whip and his other numbers, when he's keeping the ball in the ballpark, he is filthy. He is absolutely disgusting. And just, you know, for fun here, you as one of the pitching gurus, if, say, we talk about in all these drafts, you want to get an ace early. Say you don't go ace-ace, you just get, like, one, and then you come back-to-back -back with, like, a Ray to knock a combo. Do you feel comfortable with that? That's interesting. Uh, I am all for it uh, in the sense that I, I am preaching going for one guy. In some cases, I might just go for one of Tyone and Clevenger, and that's it. Uh, I, I, it, I've been saying this a lot where I feel this is the year that we don't realize it, but there's a ton of starting pitching depth to the point that next year is the year that we say, oh man, there's so much pitching depth. Yep. And there's this paranoia that you need to get two or three starters in the first eight rounds or so that I actually initially had myself back in October that I thought you had to get three before the end of round seven. I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I was able to get Zach Wheeler as my second starter in round nine. Uh, follow that up with you, Darvish, and then and now Ross Stripling on pair, pair with Severino, and there you go. That's that's a really good rotation. Uh, you don't need that. You don't need more than that. Not to mention the other side of it. I mean, I'm planning to get five, six more starters. There are so many to talk about. Uh, I have. It's funny you were just saying right after Chris Archer, and I was looking actually at my rankings and not yours. The the, the the notes. I was saying, oh great, cool. We're going to talk about Derek Holland now. That's <laughs> the one that no one is going after. Oh, I but love Derek Holland. Derek Collins, great. I mean, yeah, you you're very aware of it being a Giants fan of yes. how good, how Derek good he became. was, and no one cared. No one cared whatsoever. Two ninety four yep. ERA, twenty five point five percent swing uh, uh, K rate down the stretch for I think it was like three months worth. It was uh, starting in June. Nuts! This is the final nineteen starts of the year, and he's back in AT T Park with the fixed movement on the rubber and improved curveball. Uh, yeah, I want this. So there's so many guys like that. You can, I mean, a lot of people have been pushing a lot of helium and myself included into uh, Joe Musgrove that we're into Jimmy Nelson. It was, we're saying Josh James. Well, I think there's talk about Alex Reyes now more so with, with Carlos Martinez hurt. Uh, but there are even more deep guys, Matt Strom, Jared Eikhoff, Renato Lopez. There's so many. I, I, and, and I, I do not feel you need to get those aces at the front. You can just pad it with exciting stuff at the end and just go get your elite offense and life will be easy. Believe me. <laughs> no, I, I love that. That's one thing I, I, I've been telling people on other shows and in, in the chats we have and stuff is go to your queue when you're drafting. I literally did it a couple nights ago. I went all the way to the bottom. Like Derek Collins is basically free, like you said. There's a bunch of guys down there. Like go get Ronaldo Lopez. Maybe if you like Carlos Rodon. There's a ton of bounce back candidates that are basically free that if they don't work, you can drop them. But right. if they work, they're going to be so good. Like I take almost all of them over Chris Archer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing is that you don't, dude, I'm never spending for Chris Archer because actually every single mock, mock draft I've done, I have found myself saying, you know, with pitchers still left at the end that I would own on my team. And it, it's, it's getting hard and hard to push out the instinct to just go get them because I love them all. <laughs> I love so many of these guys, but you have to wait. You have to be patient on it and just make yourself rich with, with offensive talent. So that, that, that's, that's my perspective on, on the draft season of 2019. I, I like it. I like it a lot. I'm, I'm going to deviate a bit because you mentioned a couple of names I want to ask you about. We'll hit, sure. some more on, we'll hit some more on the list and we'll wrap it up. But you mentioned Alex Reyes, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned him because he's not in this you know 26 to 70 range or whatever according to NFBC. But he's a big name, and he's going to keep moving up the list. Like right now, he's just outside his 80th, uh, going about pick 209. We know how good he can be. We all got bummed when he got hurt last year. Now with the Carmart uh, news, he could slip in there. They have a lot of options. How do you right. evaluate Ray as going into drafts right now? Because if he is that guy, he's going to be awesome. Right. He is an elite talent. Uh, it, it's weird. 
Um, I, I have been actually saying that it, it's a long time until the start of the year and guys could get hurt. And what do you know? Carmart's already down. Wainwright could easily get hurt as well. Oh, easily, yeah. But, you know, Waka has a history too. Um, and Flaherty, who knows what the innings impact had on him last year, being a you know first first year uh, in the books. So, well, the, the other problem is that they have Austin Gomber, they have John Gant, they have Daniel Ponce de Leon. They also still theoretically could just sign Dallas Keuchel yep. uh, if they get worried enough. And I do worry that the Cardinals could be in a situation where they just want to take it easy with Alex Reyes a bit. Um, they've done this in the past a lot. I actually call it – I have a phrase Dodgeritis for the Dodgers <laughs> where it's like we're talking about the Rich Hill and you know who the Urias and Kenta Maeda where you just don't know what's going to happen with them and it's a headache to own. Well, I have the lesser version called – it's it's Cardinal Sin – with the Cardinals, with their young guys, where you just don't know when they're going to actually get their opportunities or not. And Reyes, in my gut, says he won't be starting out of the gate, even with this Carlos Martinez stuff. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I could see him going 150 innings this year as a starter. Yeah, that's why I'm so, I'm so torn on him. because I'm with you where I, I feel deep down they're going to baby him back in here because they don't want to bring him back and have the same thing happen again with all mm-hmm. the options they have. My goodness, if like 150 innings would the way we all thought about Josh James, you give me 150 of Alex Reyes. My goodness, like, <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I would, I would yeah. rate Reyes above Josh James exactly in that respect for the same innings. Yep. Um, and then the other guy you mentioned there that I'm really intrigued by, and it's another guy, if you scroll down your queue, you can go snap because he's ahead of schedule for as much as you want to take that is Jimmy Nelson. We know how good he is, he's coming off his, his, his surgery. Things are pointing in the right direction. Um, you know, reports are maybe 120 innings or so. How are you looking at Nelson come draft time? I don't I don't know. 120 innings. That seems like on the low side to me. I I like Jimmy I would, Nelson. I would love more than that. <laughs> right. It's I, I really do like Jimmy Nelson. I think he's stuck in this purgatory for me as far as when I'm targeting starters. Mm-hmm. And I find him going in the same range of Kikuchi and Tyler Skaggs and Heaney. And I would much rather have those three arms. I just think that they're just a lot more stable and better for you through this year. Uh, so that has me away from Nelson. Also because there's still question marks about, is he actually back to where he was? He had a, a velocity spike and a uh, an increased usage on his curveball. That was super effective all of a sudden. I don't know if we'll get that back. True. So there's it's a long time between. Maybe he has to get that feel back and that takes a moment. So we'll see what happens. Um, if he's around 93, 94 in the spring, I'm really excited. Um, but we'll see where he's at. All right. Uh, a couple more I want to ask you about here, and then we'll wrap her up. A couple young guys that everyone is talking about, yeah. and I can't wrap my head around them to save my life because it depends on where you turn that morning. But let's start with Shane Bieber. Everybody's in love with him. Um, big time strikeout possibilities. Some love his pitch to contact. Depends on what you look at. But really um, cool. Shane Bieber. What's your thoughts? All right. Uh, this is a weird thought. This is something that I proposed last year that is crazy, but I think Bieber needs to walk more, guys. I need I need to see him. <laughs> you don't hear that every day. <laughs> right. Uh, this is – okay, I'm going to try and quote this right. Uh, Bieber held opponents to zero earned runs in 50% of the starts where he allowed two walks. Okay, so that's six games he did that, and three of them he allowed zero earned runs, half of them. That's fantastic. Now, in the games where he allowed one or zero walks, it was just 7.5% of the time they allowed zero earned runs. That was just one out of 13. So that's just a representation. Obviously, small sample and weirdness, all that stuff. But I think that Bieber just gives in a lot. And he doesn't have a fastball that he can give in effectively. In that it's not a 96-plus heater that he can blow by, guys. It's more around like low to mid-90s, maybe. And he's not throwing the best strikes. They just aren't. It's just not a good fastball. But he doesn't use his slider and his, uh, I believe it's a changeup. I could be getting it. It might be a curveball. Yeah, it's a curveball. I'm sorry. Um, it's a fantastic cur- slider, by the way. It's an elite slider. But he's not using it right right now. And I, I do wonder if the Indians over time will be like, hey, this is what we all do. Come into our party and join Carrasco and Kluber and Clevenger and Bauer in having bad fastballs, but excellent secondary stuff. Mm-hmm. And maybe that will adjust. And I think that's the assumption that, that everyone's making for Bieber. But Bieber still has the worst fastball of the group. And I don't think that his curveball are, is on the same level as the, the third options of everyone I just listed as well. So that makes me concerned. 
Um, yes, he did have an elevated 256 bat, but that should come down. Yes, he did have a sub 70% left on base rate. That should go up. He had a 455 ERA. That should probably be like a 380. But I don't see this as an elite guy in the making. Uh, I don't think that he... I think it's just the slider, really. And that's not good enough for me. Uh, so I I would be surprised if I get a lot of shares of Shane Bieber. I would like to see what happens. I think there's room for growth. But he's not there yet. And he's farther away from taking that leap that I think a lot of people are, are thinking. So yeah, we're, we're, we're on the same page here. Because I can see where the argument can be made of what he has and what he can be. But when I draft a lot, it's not per se that I don't like to take chances. Because I will from time to time. Obviously, I drafted Josh James. Like I'll, I'll take the chance. Right. At the same time, I need to see things. We saw Josh James dominate for like you know a month or so. And I know it's not a big sample size, but when he was out there, he was really, really good. Yeah. Shane Bieber, I've been like kind of scratching my head when I watch him pitch. <laughs> I'm like, I don't really know. Like I can see the blow up happening anytime, but he, he makes it work most of the time. So that's where I'm, I'm at on those two. Like another guy, Nick Pavetta. People sure. are in love with him taking the next <laughs> step. I could actually see that maybe more than Bieber, but at the same time, very skeptical. What's your thoughts on Pavetta? Well, okay. So if you if you don't know me, um, you might have gotten the sense of how I evaluate pitchers, which is very heavily based on what their repertoire is. And looking at the actual pitchers and seeing what that could dictate moving forward and what can get better and what can't. Nick Pavetta has a much better blueprint than 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 Shane Bieber. It's a four seamer that he elevates effectively, and now that does burn him sometimes. He has to rely on it too heavily. But I think that with his slider and curveball that are both great, these are really good pitches. His curveball is legit money, as I mentioned before. His slider's getting there. Uh, and also, that four-seamer had a 10% plus swinging strike rate last year. Those three pitches, that is what made Blake Snell Blake Snell this year. Yep. Blake Snell also had a fourth pitch of a changeup that was actually good in its own right. But the core of what he did and what I have actually hanging up on my wall is his strike zone plot of Blake Snell going elevated four seams a ton and then curveballs and sliders at the bottom of the zone. I think Pavetta can't do that. So I see the 4770 year array, 130 whip last year, and I think, you know, he's probably, he's, he, he can take that leap a lot more so than Shaden Bieber can because he has the three pitches ready to go and he can maintain a 27% plus strike rate, if not even higher. Uh, it's, there is that risk though. And he is someone that could turn into your Tanaka type of just being a homer heavy guy uh and i'm not going to ignore that but if we talk about bieber versus pavetta pavetta has a much clearer path to his upside yeah i like that and uh, you mentioned that snell uh picture you have if yancey eaton never has kids he should thank you for that oh uh, uh, yeah I right think, I, think, yeah. I think he, he's got that in his bedroom for crying out loud yeah i sent that to him <laughs> yeah I, I love yancey i know you know that yancey and when i saw him mention that i'm like oh no his poor wife but uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, great. Actually, I've had people that don't know what it is and think it's awesome. I think it's an amazing picture. I think we need more pictures, which I have a gut feeling you'll you'll do some more right. when they become Figure appropriate. They're pretty awesome. But yeah, I like them. I, I, I'm not going to use the comp like he's this year's Aaron Nola on the Phillies. But sure. you can see him, like you said, making that next that next step. He, you know, 164 innings last year. He can you know improve on that, get you 180 plus maybe. The strikeout stuff's been there throughout most of his career. It's just a matter of keeping the ball in the ballpark. I mean, that can be mm -hmm. tricky at, at uh, in Philadelphia at Citizens Bank, but that's something you can't really draft going into game saying, okay, he's just going to get shelled because he has too many home runs. That happens. Right. But um, I, I do like the move there. I definitely like him over Bieber. The third guy I want to kind of bring into this realm because they're all getting picked around the same time. They're all young, talented pitchers. Is Eduardo Escobar uh, – Eduardo, Eduardo Escobar. Um, <laughs> he's yeah, like, he's a good one. Eduardo, Eduardo Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I look at my thing, like, that's, well, that's wrong. That's a Diamondbacks infielder. Eduardo Rodriguez um, <laughs> developing a new slider, taught to him by Sale and Pedro, not bad people to teach you a slider. Um, and we saw how good he could be in the postseason. Where do you look at Eduardo this season, and how do you compare him to Beaver and Pavetta? This is funny. I, Eduardo Rodriguez is actually someone I've been uh, keying in on for a bit. Um, there, there are two problems with Eduardo. One is separate from everything else I'm talking about, and the fact that his knee bonks more than Dylan Floro, and he hasn't uh, had 140 <laughs> innings uh, in his entire career. Um, by the way, if you didn't get that Dylan Floro joke that you uh, weren't a Mariners fan last year. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, That's good. But anyway, um, the, the other problem with Eduardo, you're talking about him with that slider slash cutter that gets kind of the, the pitch label and goes back and forth, I think, a bit on it. It, yeah, I really do need to see that take a step forward because his fastball was not good enough last year to get by. 
And his changeup is this elite uh, chase pitch, over 50% O-swing, which is really good. That's excellent. It's it, it's fantastic to see a lefty do that because they often face more righties, which means that they can take advantage of that low and away changeup a ton. But I don't see Eduardo Rodriguez really taking the next step of having a, a another put-away pitch. You need, with everyone that is a fastball changeup, you need a really good breaking ball as well. Uh, generally, I mean, you have Cole Hamels had a good curveball, but it was really a changeup at the backbone of it, but he had the curveball. Dallas Keuchel, as we're talking about, need that slider at the bottom of the zone. You need to have that big breaker, and Eduardo is still figuring out. Both last year, that slider and cutter, under 10% swing strike rate. That's not enough. Uh, and his fastball command isn't stellar either. It has its moments. It has its games where it's going and it's cruising and works with that changeup and everything's wonderful. But when you can see it, when guys are not going at that changeup where he's not executing it right, mm-hmm. it gets hard quickly. And that changeup was a sub-30% zone rate, so he's not even getting strikes with it. And that's why you see an ERA of 382 last year as his best of his career. He's never had a whip under 125. Mm-hmm. And that's why you also see these walk rates around 8% for his career. That That's not going to go away to me. I don't think that he's... I mean, he could get that slider, and it would change things a lot if that becomes a 15% plus swing strike rate pitch. I don't, I mean, that's a big assumption to make. That's a big jump to all of a sudden have a plus offering. So I'm not going to make that assumption. That means I'm out, not to mention, of course, injury risk that I mentioned before that hasn't, uh, he hasn't been able to evade yet in his career. So you have Pavetta first out of those three, obviously. But yes. if, you're, if you had to Jane make a Bieber. choice, Bieber, then. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Rodriguez. They're actually okay. each about 10 spots between each other. Oh, cool. Um, all right, last guy I'm going to ask you about. You mentioned mm-hmm. him earlier, and I'm really curious because this could be like the ultimate. We, we love bounce back candidates. Sure. You Darvish is right yes. going right after Bieber, Pavetta, Rodriguez. Darvish was an ace. It wasn't too long ago we were drafting him in the, like the top ten starting pitchers, if not higher. He was hurt last year. New surroundings. Maybe he's better this year. What's your thoughts on Darvish? My thoughts on Darvish is that if he's healthy, uh, yeah. first of all. 2018, we threw out the window. That was just the, the man's elbow was broken. I uh, throw it out the window. Every other year, sub four ERA uh, in his bad year, 2017, and I'm doing air quotes. I <laughs> uh, it was a 116 WHIP with a 27% K rate and a 386 ERA in 186 innings. I, I think that he's better than that, and he had some ridiculous, ridiculous blowups in that time as well that made everything just stupid. He had a 10 earned run game against the Miami Marlins. <laughs> I remember. All that. right, <laughs> I'm just brutal. This, come on. And what's even more brutal is that the game before it was 12 strikeouts, and the two games after it were 10 strikeouts each. So <laughs> it was a weird season. I think there were times like I would imagine in that game where his elbow just was weird and done, and that messed up everything. I'm willing to say a healthy Darvish on the Cubs for full full year is a top 25 pitcher. I think we are going to get 150 plus innings out of him, more like 170 or so. And that with that strikeout rate and his ability, I mean, this should be like a three, four ERA season. That's elite almost. I mean, that, that's a really, really big impact starter. So I have him in the top 25. I felt very lucky to get Darvish. I think it was in the 11th or 10th round uh, of my draft. Um, I, I got him in the 10th round as my third starter. I'm stoked to have that. I think that's something that everyone should be targeting. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of him. When when I get sniped on you, Darvis, I'm very angry because I'm thinking, okay, it's one of those games I play chicken with myself and lose. Right, that's sure. The problem. I'm like, okay, he's going to fall a little more. People are nervous, and then now someone takes him. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the concern there. But, Nick? This was an absolute pleasure. This was awesome. Great news. We will do this again sometime. But uh, before I let you go, again, why don't you plug away and let everybody know where they can find you. Uh, well, this is a great time. I really did enjoy this, Bubba. You can find me at PitcherList, uh, also PitcherList.com. Check us out on, uh, on SoundCloud with our PitcherList podcast network. And uh, if you like starting pitching, just read our SB Roundup through the year. It's every single morning. Uh, it gives you an update on every single starting pitcher, what they did last night, and what it means for your fantasy team. Yeah, there's about four guys I really go too hard for pitching. It's Nick, Spore, Eno, and Matt Modica. And uh, it, it's four of the better pitching minds. And if I have to put one more phrase in before we go, I would say this podcast was an ace is going to ace performance. I <laughs> so, um, uh, love it. As we love expected. It. But thanks for joining me, man. Everybody, this is Bench with Bubba, episode 148 with Nick Pollock of The Pitcher's List. Catch you guys later.